Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mike Finale with Assure. And today we have, I, I think this uh, this is a really, it's a super important topic, but it's so easy to underestimate. Uh, it, 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 I think employee handbooks may be the single biggest, most important, valuable HR tool that an employer can have. Uh, and so we're kind of in the camp that you have to do them. Uh, uh, and in fact, you're you're kind of at real risk if you don't. It, it really is that important. Um, the the problem is, it's it's deceptively simple, deceptively complex. Because if you do it wrong, you could actually make it worse on yourself by documenting the wrong things in a handbook. So uh, today we have uh, the best guests I can possibly think of uh, on this topic. Uh, Mary Simmons, she's our Vice President of HR uh, Consulting for Assure, uh, and, and she's going to help us uh, unpack this. She spent uh, uh, eight years as an adjunct professor at New York Institute of Technology. Prior to joining Assure, uh, she led the HR consulting practice for 11 years for a New York based law firm, Portney Messenger, Pearl & Associates. She also held other prestigious roles, HR roles at Lee Heck Harrison, spent 16 years in HR at the Bank of New York. So someone who knows this subject inside and out and a regular guest of the show, Mary, welcome back. Thank you. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I think we're gonna have a, a good healthy hour discussion here, um, but just in three buckets. And the first one is, you know, help everybody just to simply understand why uh, everybody needs uh, an employee handbook. It, it, it's not because the law requires you to have an employee handbook and right. specify components thereof, uh, but there's a bunch of things the law does specify and the handbook is kind of like the perfect medium to deliver this, right? Exactly. So there are so many reasons that employers need handbooks. This could take us an hour right here, Mike. Um, right. But for, for starters, one of the things that we always tell our clients is that on the HR side, we like to stand on two pillars. One pillar is compliance, and the other pillar is engaging our employees and helping them be more productive. And the handbook is gonna be one of your tools that you can use to do both things. So let's start with the compliance side. So on the compliance side, there are federal, state, and local laws that your employees have to get in their hands, right? So different laws have posting requirements. They have a requirement that we give that policy to our employees in their hand. And there's many that are both. And those laws, like you said, this is the perfect way to put all of those compliance necessary policies in a handbook. It's in one place, right? It starts the employment relationship with the employee. We explain those laws. We have them sign off on the handbook so we can prove that they got it. Um, and then we move forward with our, with our uh, employment relationship. Now on yep. the engagement productivity side, that handbook is going to live through the life of that employee and help us with great things like culture, like expectations. So it's on us when our employees do something incorrectly and we never told them the right way to do it, right? And it could be something simple like, you can't just work overtime without getting approval. That's something I hear from employers over and over and over again. I'm like, what's in your handbook, right? And a lot of times, Mike, what I'll do is I'll say, let's print out that policy that's been difficult. Let's first have a manager's meeting and unpack it and explain it to the managers. And then we can have an all staff meeting. We can send it out to the employees separately, whatever it is to get that communication across. And that is a key factor of that handbook. It is the best way for us to communicate with our employees and our managers, right? So it's keeping our managers consistent. Verbal warning, first warning, final warning, possible termination, right? And the more consistent we are with our employees, that keeps us out of a court of law every time. Mary, forgive me if I'm jumping ahead on you, but so so no. reason number one is there are just there are specific laws that must be communicated uh, to employees, right? Um, Correct. In, Look, I'll, I'll probably want to come back there if we could kind of recap what the biggies are for folks. Um, then you kind of, in one sentence, said culture and 
uh, it was culture and employee relations, something along those lines. And then you went into an example of uh, expectation setting, right? And so it seems obvious to me that uh, if you can, if you communicate expectations clearly, uh, then better chance of compliance, uh, better chance of uh, no misunderstandings, hurt feelings, legal action down the road. That all makes sense. To speak more into the, the culture component because I, I, I've talked to uh, uh, employers before that, you know, that they, they don't want things like that. They literally don't have said, I don't want to put time and attendance system in place, uh, even though I know it might save me money because that's not the culture I want. I don't want everything documented. I, I don't, I want, I want to trust my employees and I don't want to have to spell everything out and put it and put it in writing. But what, what about people who think, uh, that this is a, an employee handbook is an overly legalistic document that is actually counter to the culture that they're trying to create. What, what would you say to those folks? I would say that if you really want to communicate your culture, you have to put it in writing. And the other piece is, you know, you had a great webinar on the great resignation. So if we want to attract individuals to our organization, we need to look professional. And we need to specifically talk to those individuals that we're interviewing about our culture. And what better way to do that but to say, hey, Mike, thanks for your interest in the opportunity with Assure. Let me send, send over my employee handbook so that you can review the policies and procedures and the way we approach things. And on the culture side, what, what would be a policy or procedure that would speak to culture? So let, let's, let's just give some examples. So yeah. a lot of employers will give employees a day off to volunteer. Well, that speaks volumes about the culture that that organization has. And I can tell you that the millennials, which are our largest uh, generation in the workforce right now, that's something they're looking for. Do you give your birthday off? Is it unlimited PTO? Even the in the beginning, when I do handbooks with employers, I'll say, hey, Mike, here's an introductory paragraph, but I invite you to customize this so that it is really coming from you, right? And that speaks to culture. How is that owner, CEO, president, whomever is writing that introduction at the beginning of the handbook, what does that say? What's the voice that's coming through? That's gonna talk to culture. So if somebody really feel strongly about their culture, they should be able to articulate it and it should be infused in every single policy and in the voice of that handbook. So I, I, you know, I'm on calls with employers all day, every day. And my, one of my first questions is, do you have a handbook? And a lot of them say, yes. And I say, where'd you get it? And they say, I Google searched it. <laughs> and I'll say, hmm, did you customize it at all? Right. Because when you Google search it, you don't know whether that Texas, California, New York handbook was for one employee, five employees or 100 employees. You don't know what local area of those states that handbook was. And it certainly doesn't have the voice of your particular culture infused in it. We customize every single handbook for all of the employers that we work with. And that's and the reason why. Even if it's for somebody in the same industry, same size, uh, same locations, same uh, number of employees across the street from you, uh, that doesn't mean they did it well, <laughs> right? They, no, they could have no. done, done it poorly, right? A hundred percent. And and I don't think any of our employers that we work with Want, if you and I were selling cookies across the street, I don't want to be exactly like you. I have to differentiate myself to be able to attract and retain the best talent. So my handbook is one of my communication tools to do that. That's why. So Mary, so that speaks to me as a marketing guy. Um, uh, <laughs> talk to me about language. Um, because so like I think about building a website, like I, if I'm building a website for one brand, it might be very proper English, right? I might choose a serif based font like Times New Roman uh, to look just classic and formal and proper. But I might have another brand 
uh, that is edgy and not formal counterculture. And I might have uh, sans serif fonts. I might use no capitalization. Uh, uh, grammar might be sketchy because I'm, I'm writing as uh, in, in almost like slang speak. Um, it's it, on, on one side, it's the uh, I'm sorry, this page cannot be found. On this page, it's oh snap, I don't know what happened to that search, right? But when I think about an employee handbook, I I have this connotation. I think others probably do too. That it's a little bit more of a legalistic document. How how much latitude? can people should people take in the in the formality of the language of a handbook uh because i think when pe most people who are not used to negotiating contracts get scared to death uh reading you know things things like indemnification and limits of liability don't creep into the normal language right um how, how natural language can we make these handbooks you, you can make the language um relatively look it has to be easy for your employees to understand if they don't understand it we've missed our mark 100 percent and when it comes to policies like your eeo policy that needs to be in every handbook because that's employment equal employment opportunity which is a federal law you're not really changing that much and you shouldn't because that is a legal policy from the federal gov government so there's only certain places that you have latitude, but let me give you a great example. A lot of employers like for the first three months of an employee's relationship with them to be a little bit different, right? And so when I read a handbook and, and I'm going over it, a lot of employers will say, this is your probationary period. So first of all, there's no such legal thing, right? There's not a, we're not in jail. <laughs> There's not a probationary period where, you know, you're gonna get put back in jail. Like to me, that term is right off the bat negative. So I'll invite employers. And first of all, I explain that if you're an employment at will employer, if you're in a state that's employment at will, you know, just saying in your handbook that that's a probationary period does not make it easier or harder for you to terminate that employee, right? Whether they're there one day or uh, you know 2,000 days, if you're an employment at will employer, in theory, right? Um, it's just as easy to terminate them. So I invite employers to say, this is your introductory period. This is the time where you enter into the employment um relationship with our organization and you should be asking questions and we've set you up with a mentor and in three months we're going to sit down and have a you know stay interview and you'll tell us you know what you liked and what you didn't like that's the change in terminology that i invite employers to do not you're on a probationary period if you do anything wrong we can terminate you you really don't need to say that in an employment at will um, situation. And I'll just let me give you a couple more examples that I think are really important, which is what are you calling your employees, right? So some employers already have a term that they like to use team members or, um, you know, using the exact term like manager or supervisor. And the other thing that I see a lot is we have a lot of nonprofits that we work with. And when they just Google search a handbook, it says our company, our company, our company. It's not a company, it's an organization, right? So I think the terminology is very important to yeah. tie in, again, your culture, but also make it easier for your employees to understand. If you're calling them team members in the workplace and your handbook says employee or staff, you know, it just there's just a disconnect. This is your communication to connect everything, your policies, your procedures, the legal side of things, the compliance side of things, and your culture. Right, right. So one of the other things I think about, um, you know, so there's obviously the law you have to follow. There's policies uh, that you build, you know, pur purpose-driven policies, right? Not just things right. you inherit, you don't know why you did it, but what's the real purpose behind them? You communicate that. 
And then uh, come back to the culture issue. Um, I feel like so many times companies, whether it's a handbook or uh, uh, something that doesn't get communicated, a new handbook, a new program, a new initiative, and I always liken it to the Viking funeral. There's a big celebration. Uh, the, you have the raft, you set it on fire, you push it out and gets out about 100 yards and just slowly sinks and dies its death, right? Um, <laughs> in, can you speak to, my, my point here is, can you speak to how this thing needs to be a living, breathing document? Uh, at what frequency should it be updated? And where I'm really more going is, how do you institutionalize this as a management training tool? Right. So this is the playbook for managers to coach, to reinforce, to give advice and, and, and to reinforce all this, the, the, the legal structure, the policies, the culture with their teams or employees or staff or whatever they call it in their playbook, in their handbook. Yeah. So the manager should go, you know, refer back to the, in the handbook. When an employee says, well, why can't I have five weeks vacation? Well, let's go to the handbook and see what the policies say there, right? And that, again, will keep our managers consistent because if they're all going back to the handbook, nobody's saying, oh, okay, Mike, I really like you. I'm going to give you five weeks off. No, we're giving the managers this tool to keep them consistent across the organization. Because it might be really good for Mike to take five weeks, but Scott might be really upset when he sees Mike out five weeks and he knows everybody who's been, you know, at the organization for three years only gets three years. That inconsistency causes us a lot of problems. The other thing um, that you first said was looking at the handbook. So a lot of times, again, I'll be talking to an employer and they're like, I have a handbook and I had an attorney do it for me. I'm like, great. I'm sure that cost you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, but when did you have that done? Oh, I had it done five years ago. And so even if you're in a state that isn't changing laws like California, Massachusetts, New York, you know, every six months, um, it's still important for employers to look at that handbook at least every year and say, wait a minute, we don't even use time cards anymore. And it says clock in on our you know time in time out policy right again that leads to our organization not looking as professional as we are right this is a professional communication it should be reviewed i'm going to say every six months by a professional because things change all the time on the federal level and the state level but it also changes within your particular organization. And again, consistency is very important. And even if things don't change, you might say, I really think we need to describe how people can't just, you know, the things that I hear all the time is, you know, people just sign in, you know, they get here early because the bus gets them here early. So they sign in a half hour early, even though they're sitting having a cup of coffee. Um, yeah. We need to explain that to our employees. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to you, you, you give a use case of hey of this like probationary period no no such legal standing no such legal th the topic um, but maybe you describe what your policy is around you know first 30 90 days and maybe you conduct a stay interview how much risk is there in if, in if tell me if you're going to cover this later uh, under what not to include in the handbook but how how much risk do you put um, saying too much, saying, okay, and that such and such day, we're going to have a stay interview, but then you don't have the stay interview, right? Uh, and then so later on, okay, we're uh, we're an at-will employer, and we decide to terminate this person, and they come back and, and sue, hey, wrongful termination, they never gave me that stay interview, the, the, the handbook said. Uh, what, what, what kind of ex value and or exposure is there in being... Uh, at having too much in the handbook. Yeah, and we uh, and I was going to cover it in what not to do, and that's exactly right, Mike. You should not have policies in there that sound good if you're not doing them. Um, and the other thing <clears throat> is that you know you need to button up that handbook because you're going to use it to defend yourself in a court of law, even if it's just an unemployment hearing, right? 
that handbook is going to be your defense. And so it has to be buttoned up. It has to be real, like you're giving your example. Um, and the you know repercussions of us not exercising those policies, either properly or at all, can be catastrophic for an employer because it can go against you in a court of law versus defending you. You're absolutely right. Okay. Um, anything else? So I have another question that I think it can go to any of these topics, what you should include or shouldn't include, but uh, anything else you wanted to cover just on why employers need to have handbooks in the first place? I think we covered most of it and, and it'll sort of be, you know, as ongoing through this presentation, I think uh, our listeners are going to understand what, how important that handbook is. Yeah. All right. So here's my question. Forgive me if I'm throwing a, a curveball at you here. Um, Not at all. I used to coach uh, li my, my kids uh, in sports. Uh, my favorite was coaching uh, uh, youth football. And I remember uh, early days uh, just getting all jacked up and intense about it. And I could feel the kids <laughs> up in the intensity and they're like, Grr, go get them coach. You, you kind of love that. But I, but I saw their, their, uh, they were all pumped up and ready to go to war, but they weren't very good. And where I became a lot better coach is when I did less yelling and more explaining the why and, te and literally teaching with there's moments for intensity and yelling in a good way. Uh, but uh, the more I could explain why we were doing what we're doing, the, the better football players they became. So I'm curious about, a, a, a hand, and, and so I think back in those days, like a, a following a playbook, why are we doing this? Why is this your assignment? Because this person's responsibility is this. Um, how much why can we and should we include in these handbooks? Because to me, if you just say, uh, this is our, this is our policy for punching and punching out, but there's no why. People will fill in the story with their own worst version. Well, they require me to punch in because they don't trust me. Well, maybe there's a really good reason that has nothing to do with trust that you, you would like to be able to communicate. How much of this stuff can and should or shouldn't be in a handbook? Well, that's, that's part of the communication. That's part of the voice. When I talk about voice is that, you know, we are including statements like, please clock in so we can ensure that we capture your hours and pay you correctly. So there is a why included in these things. And I do feel like that is very important. That is a key uh, coaching uh, technique um, for, for managers and supervisors. And since this is coming from management, the handbook, it is important to include the why so that the employees do I don't know how much they're filling in a negative reason, but I think it's more important from the vein that, you know, the employee might say, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, so it helps them when they understand why, well, you're not gonna get a paycheck that's accurate if you don't sign in. Um, oh, now I'm really gonna sign in, right? So that why is important from a cultural standpoint on many things, and it's also important on a, efficiency standpoint right like the yeah. you know we give a day off to volunteer if that's all there is in your policy you're really not going to get um a, a lot of accolades from your employees it's we care about social justice and because we care about social justice and helping others we would like to give all of our employees a day off to volunteer so that we can all help those less fortunate than us. You know, making a statement like that, again, I'm infusing my culture, I'm giving the why, exactly what you're saying, Mike, I'm not just saying go ahead and volunteer. It, that, that sounds like it's work, right? We want it to be a positive. So keeping it on a positive note, introductory period versus probationary period, though that kind of terminology is very important. Yeah, very good. All right. Uh, so I think this is one of those topics. There's a bit of a, there's a good uh, theory, theory conversation we could have, which I love. There's probably also a really practical uh, checklist that you need to talk through. So, so what? A, let's start with that. What, what are the, some of the really just drop deads that need to be part of everyone's handbook? Yeah, so in, I'm going to talk about things that are best practices, and I'm also going to talk about some of the legal 
requirement. So the first thing that is a best practice is the company history, your mission, your vision, your values, and that welcome statement that I talked about. So, and that's gonna be obviously different for every organization and we should be tying it, and you'll like this as the marketing uh, guru, um, you should be tying it to your employment brand, right? So one organization that I supported had a very rich history, right? It was, you know, <clears throat> a 200 year old building on a hundred acres in a, you know, very, very uh, nice area. Uh, and so we added a picture of the estate <laughs> that, the, that the offices were in and the grounds uh, talked about lunches, taking, you know, long walks through the, you know, 100 acres, you know, during your lunch break, what was the mission, what, what was the vision, you know, and it was very, very rich culture, right? Yeah. Now that's going to be different for every organization, but there's no reason that we can't add pictures there, right? I had another organization, it was a real estate firm, and they sold uh, houses, sell houses, um, in coastal areas, right? There's five harbors out here on Long Island and that's where they sell them. So we did, you know, talk about font. We did all the font in blue and turquoise, almost like our slide here, because it looked like the water. And we thought that that would be a great marketing ploy. And, and don't forget that that handbook, um, again, is a great way to attract people to the organization. Um, and so tying it to their brand was really, really important. One legal thing, so that, that's a soft side, that's a best practice. On the I'll legal just, side. Before, before the legal, I just think, I, you know, I was interviewing a candidate the other day, and uh, she, you know, she talked about how important diversity, equity, and inclusion was to her in choosing which company she would work for. She was interviewing me probably as much as or more than I was interviewing her. Um, and... Uh, uh, it, how powerful uh, it, it is to be able to not just wing it and talk about what we what what the interviewing uh, the hiring manager's opinion of these things are, but actually to state what our policies and procedures are, and it led to a much more powerful conversation. So uh, I'm I'm 100 with you. Yeah, 100. DEI is very important right now. So on the legal side, I was I was starting to say you need a strong employment at will statement. That's assuming that you are an organization that employment at will is um, in your state and also um, your business, right? So civil servants are not at will um, employees. But of course, we walk through this with all of our employers. But for all of those employers that are um, under employment at will, there should be employment at will statement within the handbook and also a statement that this handbook is not a contract of employment, right? So two different things, both you have to have in that handbook um, to make sure that the employee understands what that handbook is. And also on the legal side, I had you know, stated the EEOC policy, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, that's a federal law, but there right. are state EEO departments, Department of Labor's, that may have different protected classes. So you need the federal, but then you may need to add the state and you may need to add the local protected classes because they could be different. I can tell you in New York that New federal is one, New York state is another, New York city has a third set of protected classes. So again, this is yeah. very difficult for an employer to do on their own, if not impossible. If you, if you are a regular watcher of this show, weekly show, you, you know this has been a recurring theme. It's not just the accelerated rate at which there are federal laws or, that, that impact HR. You know, you, and you go all the way back to 1938 uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, and you had the biggies around hour, uh, hours you could work in a day and overtime, child labor laws, the 60s about civil rights, equal pay, um, 70s OSHA, uh, workplace safety, uh, it, it, and it just kind of has been accelerating. But what's been backbreaking for for most businesses is not the acceleration at the federal rate; it's the multiplication that's happening at state and then local levels, where 
these things are layering upon each other and everyone is accelerating. And so it's not just an accelerated pace of the federal, it's times number of states, times number of uh, uh, local municipalities within those states. Uh, it, it's, it's almost impossible to keep up with in most of the time Google is your friend. Google can get you in trouble here if you don't really know what you're doing. Yeah, it's really easy to misread these things. And then again, even if you read it properly, you want to understand where you can customize it for your um, organization and where you can't. And so that leads me to my next thing that we should include. And again, we don't have the time to go through every single thing. We're, we're hitting the high points and the really important ones today, but time off policies, right? The year, you'll find that your employees will go, oh, thanks for the handbook, and they'll go, where are the time off policies? And flip <laughs> right, right back to right. the time off policies. So right. it's really important that that is easy to understand and also that it meets any state um, time off policies, right? So not every, the federal government does not mandate any vacation and no states mandate vacation, but many of them will mandate sick time and you know just a little word about this because a lot of employers and i'm just going to use new york and california because you know th they have the sick time policies but many other uh states do um i'll have employers say well mary i give two weeks vacation so that satisfies the eight days that i have to give for new york sick time policy and i'll say not exactly so what we see in the courts is that there are particulars that you have to put in your policy to explain to your employees that this is not just vacation time, that you can use it for sick time. And oh, by the way, you know, there's different tracking requirements for those laws. So I think this is where employers get into a little bit of trouble. Um, and what I've seen in the courts is, yeah, I took two weeks vacation, but you never gave me those eight sick days, right? So the policy has to explain this is sick slash vacation. And then there's certain um, parameters that have to be included in that policy so that it does match the mandate from that particular state. So that takes, believe me, it's it's like a mathematical equation to get that right. But again, what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about compliance and I'm thinking about engagement, right? And to engage our staff, we have to be able to give them time off, but they have to be able to understand it. And on the compliance side, just giving the time is not gonna be enough. You still may get, um, and in this case, this court case um, that I'm speaking of, you know, the employee just got an extra eight days even though they got a two week vacation, you know, and those time, your time off policies also need to include what happens at termination. Like if I'm due two weeks vacation um, and I quit before I take it, do I get it paid? And just a quickie about this, and, and um, there's so much to go over that I don't wanna to take too much time, but a lot of employers will say, no, they quit, I'm not giving them I'm not paying out their vacation. So you know what your employees are gonna do? Hey Mike, I'm giving you two weeks notice, but I'm taking these two weeks off. And you're right. really, you know, now you have the choice. I'm gonna terminate you now and not do it. But if they're paid out for that vacation, a lot of employees will give you that two weeks or three weeks notice. They'll work through it knowing they're getting that little check. So again, we are prompting our employers to look through each of these. Obviously, you also need a benefit summary. Just a word of caution about your benefit summary. Make sure in that policy and at the beginning of the handbook, it says these policies and procedures can change at any time with or without notice, okay? Again, I've seen lawsuits where the employee is like, well, you said that I have, you know, guardian life insurance and it's, you know, free. And then all of a sudden you decide to start charging for it. And they're like, mm -mm -mm. I signed that handbook and that's what my handbook says. So again, when you're changing those policies, like you had said before, Mike, you don't have to send the whole handbook out again, but you should be sending that policy. And for, for my 
um, benefit, please get that policy signed, slip it into your, um, you know, virtually into your employee file for that individual. And talking how, about time off, sorry, Mike. How much wiggle room do you can, go through? <laughs> uh, yeah, no worries. I, I'm just wondering how much wiggle room do you, do, do you get as an employer putting that kind of safe harbor, uh, hey, you know, this can change at any, any moment's notice, but what if, I mean, what if my policy says X, the law changes to Y, and there's an elapsed period of time before I know about it and then update my handbook. I mean, it would seem to me that you some wiggle room around saying, hey, uh, not only could the handbook change at any time, but laws might change at any time that we must comply with. Can you, maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. Is that a thing? Well, the, the, that statement says both. You know, this can change, and and that that should cover employers. I haven't seen anybody who includes that statement when they change their policy or the laws. The laws change. The employer doesn't have a choice, right? So they can't be out of compliance. Um, right. So, do you really need to state that? No, uh, you okay. can okay. Um, for sure, but and it, and it couldn't hurt. But while we're on the time off policies, let's also talk about federal, uh, federal policies such as Family Medical Leave Act, which is only for employers over 50 employees. So again, when we do a handbook for an employer, we have to look at the state or states they're in. We have to look at the locality that they're in. We have to understand, are you union, non-union, civil service, not civil service, and how many employees will make a big difference in the policies that are included, like I'm saying FMLA. And a lot of these policies changed during the pandemic. Um, FMLA said, gee, if you had Mike working in the Texas office, and that office has 50 employees, and then Mike ends up going um, and living in another state that is not <clears throat> within the radius that FMLA states, Mike still gets FMLA. So things like this happen all the time and our team is eating and breathing it, but, but, and we certainly have different ways for our employers to stay in compliance. I mean, we're sending updates on a daily basis and I know for sure we're doing webinars and keeping everybody in compliance, but things can get missed easily. And that's why it's great to have an, a partner like the HR consulting team. Additionally, some states have disability uh, policies and that should be in your handbook. There's only six states, believe it or not, that have disability, uh, New York being one of them, but that policy should be stated there. Now state disability says, hey, Mike is the employee, he has to apply for state disability, but you should be helping your employees. Oh, Mike, you're out for six days, here's the state disability forms, um, please fill them out and, and we'll get them submitted to our carrier. Something that that is was new, let's say, um, <clears throat> probably like five to seven years ago, are those electronic communication policies, right? So, what can and can not employees say on social media? What should they be doing in emails to each other, texts through Teams, etc. Um, I think it's important that when we talk about our uh, you know, anti-sexual harassment policies that we talk about, you know, which is also something that should be in every handbook, whether it's mandated or not, that we also say that even in emails, texts, on Teams, et cetera, um, that we have a policy where there is zero tolerance for any kind of discrimination. But those electronic policies, you have to be very careful. The National Labor Relations Act states that union or not union, because they govern union environments typically, um, we can't chill, and that's the term that you should be using in your handbook, employees at, uh, protected concerted activity. What the heck does that mean? That means, so I like you to state it that way and then we explain it. It means that you have the right to talk about conditions of employment. Uh, my boss is, is Scott and I hate him. I'm allowed to put that on Facebook and 
you better not fire me for that. That's protected concerted activities. Now, the NLRA, you know, changes the strength at which they are exerting, exerting themselves into employers. So that's a little bit on the downswing right now, um, but we're looking at it all the time. Another really important piece is no privacy in the workplace. Um, that the employees understand that we can, as an employer, look at the, the computer that we own, if we own the phones, we're allowed to look in your desk if we want to. We're even allowed to look in a briefcase or a pocketbook if you bring it onto our site. Now, before people start going, <gasps> um, that's why I want you to have the policy here. You have to look at states and localities to see if it meets it. But I will tell you that New York, and I, I believe California will be enacting it as well, has a mandate that you tell employees what you're looking at um, as far as, you know, are you going to listen in on calls? Are you going to, you know, look at their emails periodically? Um, so it's becoming even more important that we communicate that fact to, to our employees because, you know, some of the states are enacting laws that say you have to tell them if you're going to be looking or listening in. So, so increasingly, most all legislation, regardless federal, state, local, is continues to tilt towards employee protection, right? So, so you're, what you're saying is increasingly, you can't just use some blanket statement, "Hey, no right to privacy in the workplace." You get, you're saying you're going to have to be a little more explicit in the things that you would be willing to, not that you're going to, but that you would be willing. To uh, to to listen in or watch or examine as an employer, like web, like web browsing activity. Absolutely, and and I'll add there, Mike. A lot of employers have cameras in the work site. My recommendation, and Brian Shanker from Jackson Lewis, our friend who does webinars with us, recommendation is that you post a sign that th this is, you know, there are cameras in this area. Obviously they can't be in restrooms um, or any place that an employee would change, but employers have found those cameras have come in handy. You know, Mike hit me, sure. you know, oh, where were you guys when he hit you? Oh, let me, let me go to the, the replay, right? So it is important that we post a sign um, that says that and just kind of going down you know, our list of things, you know, now if we're remote, if you now have remote employees and you've never had remote employees, please have a remote or hybrid policy. Employees need to understand that what the parameters that you have put in place, right? So I, I can think of one employer where he was like, I don't understand, Mary. I le I'm letting everybody have a hybrid policy, but then I'll try to call somebody nine to five and they'll be, you know, ghosting me and, and not, not around. And when I talk to them, they're like, oh, well, I decided since I'm working from home that I'm gonna work, I don't know, 5 p.m. till 12 in the morning instead. And the employer's like, um, I never said you could do that. And I said, well, do you have a policy saying they can't do that? Yeah. How would they know that, right? So again, this is a communication tool. If you're gonna have a remote, and or hybrid policy, please have that work policy and make it as explicit as possible. When we're on a Teams call, you still have to dress professionally. When we're on a, uh, a Zoom call, you need to uh, have your camera on 100% of the time. Whatever it is, we need to tell our employees because we can't expect them to meet our requirements if we don't tell them what those are. Right. Additionally, we had, we had talked about disciplinary policies and that should be there so that we set expectations. Were you gonna jump in there, Mike? No, no. Um, obviously we should document um, how time is worked, right? So where to sign in, when to sign in, right? And make sure that you are following the Fair Labor Standards Act. So. I can't tell you how many times I was on a call last week with an employer and he's like, 
yeah, I had an exempt employee and I noticed that she was only working 20 hours a week. So when she resigned, I took back 20, I docked her 20 hours for each work that, you know, she should have worked 40 and she only worked 20. I said, please don't do that again. <laughs> Call me. This is why you need me to help you, right? The other thing that I hear all the time is, oh, you know, Mike's non-exempt. He worked 45 hours, but instead of getting overtime, Mike really wants five hours off in the next pay period. You cannot contract around the law, right? Even if your employee says they want to do that, instead of getting the time and a half, you can't do it. They have to get the time and a half. And just and so everybody understands in a situation like that, even if your relationship with that employee is fantastic and that interaction, that transaction doesn't blow up on you, it's kind of a it's kind of when not if there's some type of report by some employee at some point in the future, Department of Labor investigates, they go back and audit all this, and you're paying for that five hours overtime, whether the employee expected it or not, uh, as a result of an audit plus penalties, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. That is a big no-no. Um, and along those lines, meal and break times, right? So, you know, many states have mandated break times, right? So New York, you work six hours, you have to get a half hour off. And that is not eating at my desk, answering a phone, right? If I'm still working during that meal break, even though I can eat, I get pay paid for that time. So <clears throat> very important to make those policies clear and to be following them to the letter of the law. Um, and then of course you can add workplace violence and safety policies, how employees report injuries. Um, and a, the violence is gonna be separate from that anti-discrimination policy that we talked about earlier. And so those are really the high points to what should be included in the handbook. Obviously, there's customized policies that mm. other employers should include, and there's there's some one-off policies from different states, like, like in New York, uh, blood donation, bone marrow donation, voting policy, I could go on and on, and the same for California, right? Because they'll have leave laws that are specific, Massachusetts as well to that particular state. So there is, you know, again, Mike, we could we could be here, you know, all day explaining what's right. there. Those are your high points that I feel are the most important and just to reiterate a signed acknowledgement. Yeah, I, th I think we could have a webinar each one of those single bullets. <laughs> so uh, spend just a minute on, on signed acknowledgement. Um, what what are what are acceptable forms of of signed? I mean, I'm assuming electronic, obviously paper, ink based. What 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 are some best practices to follow here? Uh, they're all acceptable if you have a good HRIS system, like we have uh, with the Sure Payroll. You could have them sign it electronically and just whisk it right electronically into that HRIS system. Um, if you do not have that available at your organization. You know, it's it's fine to go old school and just have them sign it. Um, that's a detachable piece of paper. You take that acknowledgement and put it in their employee handbook. Uh, I mean, employee file. So both yeah. are acceptable. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, now, this next time. So it's, that, those are the highlights of what should be included. I, I always struggle with what should not be included. So you, I, I want you to share some of the biggies. Uh, and what I think about it here is uh, it's almost like parenting. I can't tell my kids all of the things that they shouldn't do, right? They <laughs> have to plug in them having judgment because they're going to come up with something creative that they shouldn't do that I didn't think of, right? So <laughs> how do, how should employers think about uh, what not to put in a handbook when they can't think of all of the things that you're not supposed to do? Right, right. Yeah, you're so you're so right. Um, so the policies that um, I really want to caution employers. One thing that, and, and I'm basing this on, you know, 30 years of, of, of doing handbooks and what I've seen. I've seen policies that say you cannot talk about your salary. When you get a raise or when you're hired, you can't tell other people about your salary. Eh, 
So that is protected concerted activity um, under the NLRA that I spoke about. So you cannot tell employees that they cannot talk about their salary, bonuses, et cetera. Um, not, not only is it illegal to restrict that, um, the laws, you know, Brian and I did a webinar a few weeks back about the, 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 the shift, the, the sea change here around transparency uh, required even to the job description where you, where you disclose what jobs pay. The, the, the trend here is towards more transparency, not less. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think the other thing is to make sure that you're, you don't have terminology in that handbook that makes it look like a contract. So for example, you certainly can have a um, policy in your handbook that says, you know, you know, if you ever leave, you know, the organization, we have, you know, we ask that you don't solicit current employees. You can have that in the handbook, but it's not a contract. So if you want that to be um, something that you can hold that employee to, that needs to be separate and pulled out of the handbook. Um, some other things, you know, would be something like a commission, you know, you know, what right. you get for commission and the, and the different, you know, parameters around a commission policy. First of all, you know, you don't want to have policies in your handbook that don't uh, apply to most of the employees in the organization, like a travel reimbursement policy. You know, if you only have management traveling, right, and and the you know 90% of the the rest of the employees aren't traveling, it doesn't belong in a handbook. You don't want your handbook to be a hundred pages long, right? You have a travel policy, absolutely re travel reimbursement policy, but it should be separate. The commission agreement is a legal document mandated in many states, but you should have it regardless of the state you're in um, so that your employees understand, you know, different things like do they get commission if they quit and the employer hasn't paid yet. Um, so that is a legal document um, and that needs to come out of a handbook um, and certain operational policies, right? Like, you know, the way you operate machinery X that doesn't belong in a handbook either. This is HR policies and procedures. It is not meant to be um, a operational handbook. Again, it's just gonna make it too long. I think those things should be in writing, but they should be separate. Um, mm -hmm. And again, just to reiterate what we said earlier, you shouldn't have policies in there that the company doesn't, um, doesn't utilize, right? So if you say you'll get an annual evaluation and an annual raise and or an annual raise and you're that's not your practice, I would not include that in a handbook. And a lot of employers will say, but I want to do that. And I'll say, okay, when we do that and I can help you set up that performance management um, cadence, then we will add that to the policy. We will take that policy. We will give it out to the employees and we will explain it to managers, right? So uh, benefits that you do not um, have or may change quickly. So a lot of times I encourage employers to have a benefits appendix because benefits tend to change pretty frequently, right? My price went up with Cigna, so I'm going to switch to United Healthcare, whatever it is. If you know you're an employer that switches those benefits on a pretty frequent basis, I do a very short summary in the handbook, and then I have an appendix for the benefits. Because the particulars on your benefits could be 10 pages long themselves. So you may want to make that an appendix. Um, and then temporary policies like COVID. A lot of employers are saying, Mary, I need a COVID policy for my handbook. You need a COVID policy, absolutely. It doesn't belong in the handbook because again, it's temporary, we hope um, that it's temporary, right? So that is a policy I put in writing, but I don't normally put it in the handbook, especially Mike, because the federal COVID leave 
and the state COVID leaves are changing mm -hmm. so fast that to put it in the handbook, it, right. it's just it's just not the right place for it. I, I encourage employers to have a COVID communication. We look at it every week and say, what has changed for us? What has changed for the state? What has changed for the federal government? If it's good, we keep it posted and we know that we've already handed it out. If it's not, we change it. And in the beginning stages, I was changing that probably every two weeks. And if that was in a handbook, it would be a little clunky, right? So yep. I wanted it separate because I wanted it. And in many cases, it had to be posted. Mary, one of the things I saw employers kind of get a little, a little trouble with would be they would change policies as COVID unfolded. Um, and I think, you know, none of us expected a, a two year marathon uh, early days, right? So, um, but people would make changes. And then as they would say, kind of go back to the old way of doing things, there was a new expectation that had crept into the organization and to their employees. And part of this is the, just the, the part of the great resignation and just the macro events that have unfolded. Uh, but part of it was because these policy changes were a bit unspoken, that they kind of crept into the expectations of employees. And by not having these set apart as separate policies, uh, you didn't have the contrast of the here's, here's, here's our policies, here are our temporary policies. It just kind of became here's the new policies and it made it harder to walk it back to, to go back to the old world. It, and any, yeah. So regardless of COVID, we, maybe everybody's saying, okay, well, that, that's over with. They're, we're near enough over. Um, what guidance would you give about anything that is, I think what you and I would probably call a temporary situation, even if it's short-term or long-term temporary? Um, I think that the so for some employers um, that were 100% remote for a short period of time, that's a policy, absolutely, but it's a policy outside of the handbook. When I talked about the remote slash hybrid policy that I'd include in a handbook, that's if you as an organization have now decided, this is something I'm gonna do on a permanent basis. But if it was only a temporary thing, and it, and it may be outside of COVID, right? It could be, you know, we're under construction, and for now they're gonna ask for your ID when you walk in, at, in the front door or something like that, Mike, that's temporary. That's a policy. That's a communication to our employees, but it doesn't go in the handbook because it's temporary. It just doesn't make sense. Right, right. Mary, there's so much to unpack here. I think you did a really good <laughs> job in, in, a, in a relatively short period of time for how big this topic is. So uh, to, to recap, our guidance for employers, it, it, it might not be required by law, but there are so many things that are required by law that you must communicate with employees. The employee handbook, the handbook is the is the natural place to put that. So our guidance is you have to do an employee handbook. Um, our other our additional guidance is if you do it wrong, you could be in more trouble than if you didn't have it at all, which means you got to do it right. And while Google is our friend in most situations, it might not be your friend in developing uh, an employee handbook. So uh, my my hope would be that anybody who listens to, to, to this show today uh, or the recorded version in the future gets value from this and they wouldn't have to ever talk to us to get value. They could use this information to build their own handbook if they want, um, but you know, no secret here, this, this is what we do uh, and it's what specifically Mary's team does for, for folks as well. So uh, we have three very flexible levels of HR support the most expensive which, of which is still just a fraction of what it would cost to hire uh, full-time HR certified staff. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, we have HR support for managers. So just your management team uh, to, to, to call, to email, to ask questions uh, from uh, Mary's staff as their virtual HR department, right? Strategic HR, uh, it's that layered on top of that with, with some of the proactive things ar around talent management and building a team uh, and whatnot. Uh, total HR for all employees. This is when we literally are your outsourced uh, HR department where a lot of times employees prefer to actually talk to a third party to sit to maybe air grievances or air, ask questions because they know their HR manager is friends with their boss. And while they 
presume a level of professionalism. They just feel a little bit of anxiety. Can they really be open? Can they really be honest in sharing the feedback? So they really value it and it saves the employer a heck of a lot of money. Mary, will you tie in for folks where uh, uh, employee handbooks come in to, to, to the service offering from Assure? So I felt like it was so important, Mike, that I included in every single one of these levels and I think the differentiator for us is that we're customizing it. So I, I have said that many times during this presentation, this is not something you should try at home, right? This is something that you need an expert to guide you on, to customize it, not only for your organization, but for your locations. Um, and again, because of that, I've included a handbook on every one of these levels because it's that important of a document. Mary, uh, as always, I learn uh, learn every time I, I, I talk to you and uh, I'm sure our, our listeners have today as well. So thank you very much for your time and thanks to everyone else for joining us. If there's anything we can do in payroll, human resources, time and attendance, benefits, software, and obviously, HR services, we would love to help you get focused on staying compliant and building a team so you can grow your business again as we come out of these strange times. <laughs> Mary, thanks again for joining me. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.